Well, howdy. Today, we are going to be talking about the bee's needs, bee-loving plants. Today, we've got with us Mariana Wright and Stephanie Lopez from the National Butterfly Center. Welcome. Thank you. At first, I'd like to jump back a little bit and talk a little bit about the National Butterfly Center. Um, so you've got about 100 acres of property? We are. We're a 100-acre native plant botanical garden. So it used to be a commercial onion field on uh -huh. the banks of the Rio Grande River where commercial agriculture makes up sure. a vast amount of the landscape. And commercial agriculture is really of no benefit to wildlife. Right. But returning this onion field to native habitat where we've planted over 300 species of native plants in a 2,000 acre section of the lower Rio Grande Valley Wildlife Conservation Corridor. Now our plants primarily focus on the needs of butterflies sure. as host and nectar plants, but as part of a national survey that's being conducted of native bees, mm -hmm. we recently learned that a lot of our plants pull double duty. Ah. They're really fantastic and, and sustaining for both butterflies and bees and a bunch of other insects and birds as well. Sure. Well, that makes a lot of sense because all that stuff is connected, right? It's, uh, we tend to think of plants uh, or we tend to think of causes as singular events, but it's really when we're talking about ecology, we're talking about all of these communities of species functioning together, especially uh, floral and, and faunal associations. Um, so your organization also has work off-site and you have over 30 chapters uh, United States, over the United States? We do. We are the pilot project of the North American Butterfly Association, which is national. Mm -hmm. And it has chapters across the United States where they teach people, they do outreach into the community, they work with master naturalists and mm -hmm. others, native plant sales, they uh, have their own programs, they do butterfly surveys in the summer and around Christmas time. So that's some citizen science work that helps our, our other scientists understand what's happening with butterflies and trends and populations. Obviously like the monarch surveys, sure. keeping count of what's happening to them. Mm -hmm. But across America, there are endemic butterfly species that are non-migratory, that are under increasing threat from habitat loss, drought, um, disease, other things, development, of course. Sure. And it's important that we do all we can to educate the public and uh, try to reverse those trends by uh, creating good habitat that are going to take care of the insects that take care of us. And so let's talk just briefly about, you know, why are insects important? I, th I think I've heard a, a quote uh, that you've said something about, you know, when it comes to progress or people versus bugs, the bugs are going to lose. But, but, but bugs have a lot to offer to us, do they not? Bugs have everything to offer to us, um, especially the butterflies and the bees. The butterflies are our primary pollinators of all of our native plants and our grasses. Right. Those are the things that cover the surface of the earth where there's no ocean. And um, those are the things that prevent dust bowl scenarios. They keep the ground in place. They filter our water. They produce fresh air. They keep the earth cool. And in a time of climate change, that's really critical. Sure. So people understand, I think, that honeybees pollinate about one third of our food crops. But most people don't understand how critical, really, butterflies and native bees are to saving the planet. Mm. And uh, there still is no planet B. Ah, so yeah. <laughs> uh, Earth is what we've got and we need to take care of it. And the best way we can do that is by supporting the insects that take care of us. I've read some figures that uh, pollinators contribute to over 57 billion in our worldwide economy. And uh, the author, David McNeil, has said that insects are the invisible force that's keeping our, our world uh, working. Just briefly about the monarchs, uh, there are some figures that, uh, well, first of all, they've been here for 400 million years, right? So they have a place here. Uh, humans have just showed up fairly recently on the geologic time scale. Yep. Um, but, you know, we've, there's been discussions of populations going uh, up and down. 
And I know the latest count was there was a plus, right? We had a little bit of a rebound with the population. Insects are incredibly resilient. You know, they most species of insects lay hundreds or thousands of eggs because those eggs and the insects, even in their larval stages, play an important role in the food chain. Mm -hmm. So the monarchs have rebounded. It could be the result of changes people are making with the landscape, reducing the use of herbicides and pesticides, planting more milkweed, which is the best thing anybody sure. can do for the monarchs, and um, really making sure that people are aware that the butterflies, the monarch specifically, mm -hmm depends on just this one plant species, right. just the milkweed. And there are over a hundred species of milkweed in, the, in, North, in North America. So you can find the milkweed that is uh, native to your area, that belongs on your landscape through your master gardeners, through mm -hmm. the USDA website, through a variety of resources. And that is what you should focus on planting. Specifically, the monarchs are important. Again, it's not just sort of uh, altruistic. Uh, thing for us to save them, but they are an indicator species, right? They, they're they telling us what's going on with the health of our environment. Butterflies really are a canary in a coal mine. Mm -hmm. And as the butterflies decline, it is the indicator that the landscape is declining, the health of our environments overall are declining, temperatures are changing, all of the things that factor into their life cycle fulfillment and development. We're gonna jump really quickly to Stephanie now and get into your expertise yes. about, uh, you've brought a, a, a assortment of lovely plants here that are bee and uh, butterfly friendly. In this past year, we've actually been working with Paula Sharp and Ross Eatman, and they're out doing the survey out in our gardens. And as they're out there, I kind of follow her around, see what they're looking at. And some of our best butterfly, some of our bu best butterfly plants and bee ones would be like our low croton. This is one of our best plants. It has a double purpose. Of course, it has great nectar for our hair streaks, for our butterflies. It's a, a host plant, so it gives us tropical leaf wings. And it happens to be great for all kinds of bees, especially mm -hmm. sweat bees. And it is the only host plant at this point for the Tichimeca leaf cutter bee. Mm. So. In all itself, it's all in one. And that's Wonderful. our low croton. We also have that all our bees are not all just for pollen and nectar, but they need oils. So also we look at them just for pollen and for our, their beautiful flowers. Those flowers contain oils in them that allow them to feed their young. So all okay. these plants like the Barbados cherry, which is this one right here. Barbados cherry gives you beautiful flowers for your butterflies. It's a host plant for our brown banded skippers and it's also um, great for our bees. And this one works in the shade as well, right? Yes. That's, we have a big thing in Texas, <laughs> people say, what in the world can I grow in the shade? Well, here's a character right there. Exactly, and it gives delicious fruit that's really high in vitamin C. Who doesn't want that, right? You don't want to get sick. <laughs> <laughs> a beautiful one that you probably have different kinds of goldenrods. Sure. This is our seaside goldenrod. Our seaside goldenrod blooms at gorgeous yellow. It mm -hmm. attracts all these butterflies to it, and it's also great for bees. Um, something really important too is that when you're planting for your bees also to have water nearby mm -hmm. and this one as our goldenrod would be near water okay. and again really great for our bees. The bees need the water to take back to their hives and that's how they air condition okay. their hives that's how they keep that's them right. cool so the 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 water is important for the male butterflies puddling, but okay. really important for the for bees, bees to climate control their hives. So with the goldenrod, then that might be something where you're looking at maybe a, a water garden or something mm -hmm. to add. So Somewhere that, that nearby. might be a little bit more moist, loving soil. Correct. Most of our bees that are being found rare at our property mm -hmm. were near water, near embankments. Uh, so if you're planting uh, our goldenrod or other plants, you want to and you're putting them close to water, you want to make a little embankment because that's where they'll be nesting. Sure. Yes. Another important one is um, the Texas ebony. If you know Texas ebony, of course, it goes maybe 20 to 30 feet. And this one has beautiful flowers. They're very fragrant. And another important thing about ebonies is to leave the leaf litter. I think uh -huh. a lot of us coming into fall, we want to go and rake up all our leaves right. and jump in those piles. But um, these guys <laughs> have smaller leaves, of course, 
And these are great for leaf litter. You want to make sure that's where the queen bees can go and make their nests, mm. and that's where they care for their young. That's free compost, right? It's cyclic exactly. nutrient. So for the whole landscape, it's great. But I, I wasn't aware that it had also that habitat value that's so important. So yes. leave your leaves alone. Leave your alone. leaves, <laughs> definitely. And we have another one here. This is what I call my triple threat, in a good way. Oh. <laughs> uh, this is Berlandier's Fiddlewood. Fiddlewood uh, is just great for bees, butterflies, and birds. I always say first the bees come. You hear the buzzing, you smell the, that fiddlewood, you see all those bees, and right after, like in two days, then the bees cover it. Right. Your snouts, your skippers, the queens are just completely covered. And then it gives you the fruit, your berries. And that's where the birds come in. And it's a whole, it's just an overall great tree to have. The berries are really pretty, sort of a orange red color. Orange red, and then they turn purple. Oh, that's mm -hmm. nice. And the fiddlewood, you need to plant at least two in your yard, if not three, because the, the plant will then choose which is male or female, which will fruit and which will flower, typically. Okay. I think this is really helpful because we talk about we need to improve our environment, help out all these critters, but, you know, how do you do so? So these are great tools. We have an event that we want to plug, right? It's the Wild Gardens Festival. The Wild Gardening Festival, April 18th to the 22nd. We've assembled a panel of speakers for three days, programs and field trips to teach people from all over the United States about what they can do to be good habitat forming in their home or their community. Thank you so much. And next, Daphne will come up with some great tips. Mm -hmm.